Okay, we're, we're, we are recording. First question, what is the difference between a relapse and a slip? This is a great question and we get asked this a lot. What does it mean to have a recovery community guide you? Oh, those are both great questions. I wish I could see them. Oh, I'm gonna put it, I'll put it in. Um, and Usually I can, but so yeah. uh, those are two different questions? Yeah. They're just it's, short, it's, you it's read them both? Yeah, so I did. So check in answered now. You, you oh, okay, see it. great. So the first one is fairly simple, I think, which is um, to me, a relapse is I go back to old behavior and I don't tell anyone and I keep doing it. So if I were an alcoholic, that means I would start drinking again and no one would know and I'd hide it and then I'd eventually end up you know, being screwed up. So a relapse is something that you start, whether it's intentional or not, you end up back where you were, but you don't do anything about it. You just keep hiding it. And a slip to me is something that happens it happened, you looked at the porn, you call this person, but you immediately go to your people who you trust and you say, hey, this just happened and I'm worried about myself and can you help me? And then you go to your spouse and you say, hey, this happened. I know it's not gonna be a happy day, but I wanna be honest with you and let me know what's going on. And then we move on. Um, and the difference is of course, accountability and relationship because when I'm alone, I could do all kinds of things. And when I'm alone with my thoughts, I could do all kinds of things. And the reason that we wanna avoid it moving forward very far is I'm very tempted to hide. You know, I don't want anyone to, I don't, we have to push ourselves toward that honesty and integrity. But yeah, that's the difference. And what is the other question? Um, what does it mean to have your recovery community guide you? Well, I can tell you what it meant for me. It meant that I didn't make any decisions around sex without calling usually my sponsor or someone in my program. And I mean, it's no, think about AA, you know, I, if I felt like drinking and I would probably call Tammy and say, Hey, Tammy, I feel like drinking. I know you're an AA. Can you help me? I'm just new. Um, it's the same thing. It's I, I use these people as my accountability source, my guide. The reason we have sponsors is so we can have someone who's a role model to look up to and, you know, and, and someone will listen to because sometimes our own thinking isn't the best thing to listen to. So it's really about, and I think it's also not to be too deep, but uh, I argue for 12 step every time because therapy ends, go for a year, go for five years, go for 20, like I did, <laughs> but therapy will end and we have a lifetime problem. And I don't want to be in therapy for 25 years, the rest of my life, because I, you know, I need support for this problem, but I don't necessarily need to be actively working on it with people. So I always think a 12 step program is a place you can go the rest of your life. No one will ever charge you. The minute you walk in the room, you are a part of. If you raise your hand, you need help. Someone will come over and they'll invite you for coffee or they'll talk to you or they say, let's, here's my phone number, call me later. So I think, yeah, and Tammy, I'm sure you have much more to say about it. That's my two cents or three. Well, it, my thought is, and it isn't just about like, oh, Rob's thinking about drinking, you know, and so he calls me. It's like, you know, I'm having a crappy day or I'm having you know, like the, the times I've needed my recovery community in the past bunch of years had nothing to do with thinking about drinking or whatever. It was about like I was I, I was off my serenity. I was out of sorts. So, something was happening in my world. I just needed somebody to, you know, to remind me that I'm okay. I'm sober. You know, I have a roof over my head. I mean, like all of those really practical things. And I was like, oh, I am okay. You know, but it, it, it didn't even have anything to do recently with those type of things. So the recovery community, I, I was, I was a young person when I came in and I was immature and I, they helped me. They raised me up. They taught me how to live life differently and I needed that and so the recovery community is way more than just not doing whatever the acting out behavior it is it's guiding and support uh, like like Dr. Rob said it's about you know uh, you know they'll accept you no matter what you know but they'll they'll listen and the good recovery community isn't going oh you're just you're trying and you're doing so good it's like you know have you thought about this or the you know this step says this or whatever or you know, acceptance is the key on page, you know, I mean, like, it's that type of thing where there's accountability as well as support. It's, you know, it's loving and nurturing. And I, I just want to add more things if there are any addicts listening is that, you know, a lot of time I mean, we're told all the time, reach out for help, you know, call somebody when you're in trouble, make sure. But if you don't stay connected to people, I know if I didn't, if I wasn't regularly talking to someone, I don't think I'd call them when I was in trouble, <laughs> you know, and so it's building that community of people that I may be fine most of the time, but I, but they're there when I need them and I'm there when they need them. And the other piece for me is also service, you know, to be able to learn to, 
a lot of us feel so badly about ourselves that the idea that we would grow and others would look up to us and want our help is incredibly, and we give it, is incredible gift. It's part of the process. If you stay around long enough and you do well enough, then you can be a guide to others. And one of the things that makes us feel best about ourselves in life is helping other people. It's really true. Yeah, well, yeah, yes, for a number of reasons, but also that, wow, I have learned enough to be able to support somebody else in a different way. So, so it's an acknowledgement that I actually do have something to give. So, so it's, yes, I'm helping somebody else, but it also, you know, helps remind me of how far I have come. So right. I just put another one in the answer. So Thanks. how do you protect your children when their essay father has behaved in a predatory manner? Uh, grooming older non-related kids, expose himself to older kids, use porn in the presence of minor children. And this is probably a great place to talk about sex addiction versus sex offender. Can you um, elaborate on that, please? Yeah. So this is sexual offending behavior. Um, when you engage in sex or sexualized behavior that the person either is not old enough to give permission or they're mentally ill or they're drunk or, or they're asleep. I mean, when you all the way to rape and violent forms of sex. If someone doesn't have your permission, then you're using them. And it doesn't matter, you know, certain ages to date or legal and say of some states and some, you know, in different countries, but the way you can universally look at offending is if it's non-consensual. So no child, no underage person can ever give consent because they're not old enough. So the other thing is I'm really glad you're anonymous <laughs> because, um, even though I'm not working with you, if you work with any therapist in the country, they will report this issue to child services. Um, this is what, it, this is no different to me than if you said, uh, my, 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 the kids, my father's kids is hitting them. My father's, the father of my children is hitting them and they're coming home with bruises. It's the same thing as child services would step in, they would evaluate. So honestly, if, if, if I had a spouse that was exposing themselves to kids and using the porn in the presence of minor children, I'd probably be arrested. I mean, it would be reported and I would be endangering children and they would take my kids away from me. So just to say it, like if this is something you're not dealing with, first of all, the damage is, I'll tell you what the damage is. The damage isn't just the person who does it to you. If you know this is going on and your children know what's going on and you're not protecting them, the real damage is why didn't mom protect us? Why didn't mom or auntie or whatever just take this person away? I hear guys say over and over again, that it wasn't what happened to them, it's that, that they didn't get help with it, you know? And so they didn't know what to do with it. They didn't feel safe enough, whatever it was. So I wanna say that you have a role in this and your protection of them is keeping this person away. Um, you have to change the locks. You, and also you yourself, by the way, if you don't feel you have the strength or you're being violated in some way, or you yourself can call child services, you know, as long as you were doing your job and taking good care of your kids, you can say, I found this and I'm freaked out and I don't want my children to harm and I love my partner, but, um, it really just depends. Um, but this is kind of behavior that is horrifying um, on every level. And I hope that you're able to get some help with it. Well, and you know about the, um, that he's exposed himself to older kids. I don't know. I don't know what their parents know. Those kids need support too. So, so if this is just going on and at least it's not my kids, then, you know, then picking up the phone and calling someone is uh, I, like, I think the right thing to do, but that's me. And by the way, if this found, like if a teacher finds this out or someone else is a little bit more aware, they're going to call somebody and they're, but Tammy's point is really good. I think, cause I've had clients who like coach the kid's soccer team, you know, or, you know, and there they are with kids in the locker room, whatever, or they're going, or they're a Y counselor and they're going to camp. You know, I think that I know for me as a professional, when I heard things like this, I didn't just feel I had to protect the child who was in the home. I felt, well, I didn't feel I knew that I had a responsibility to make sure that this person wasn't coming in contact on a regular basis with children. So this is a very, very big issue. And it, this is not sex addiction. It may be part of it. In fact, I just want to say I did, um, some of you know, I do podcasts and I do a podcast called Sex, Love and Addiction. And uh, there is, one of the leaders in my field is Stephanie Carnes, Dr. Stephanie Carnes. And we did a, I think a very popular podcast and one I'm hearing Tammy this last week on sex addiction and violence, sex addiction and offending. So if you listen to Sex, Love and Addiction, the most recent podcast is one on this very topic um, because we both felt like, wow, we need to talk about this. It's in the news. And so we did. So I think if you switch to the open, you should be, I think we're tracking now. So I am the partner of a sex addict husband that we, okay. And I'm confused about responsibility versus no control. Is the sex addict responsible for their actions if they have no control? When, 
they see it as a red flag when they started about when they were starting thinking about sleeping with prostitutes. So I'm gonna let you go first, Tammy, because I think this is a complicated question. I'm not sure I've got it right. So I'm gonna make you make a stab at it. So I often say to partners and addicts, but you know, addiction is a reason, not an excuse. So we are always responsible for our actions, even if they're during our acting out behavior. You know, Dr. Rob was talking about the 12, actually we were both talking about the 12 steps. And part of the 12 steps is taking responsibility for our actions and how we've hurt people. The difference is, until I had tools to use, until somebody showed me a different way. When I was in active addiction, I didn't know any difference. And there might have been one fleeting moment before you know he reached out and you know hired a prostitute. I don't know. I don't know what the initial circumstances were, you know. And there there were something I suspect leading up to all of that. The clients that come to us at Seeking Integrity Los Angeles treatment program, you know, the acting out is a symptom. I say this all the time too, it's a symptom. We're looking at the underlying issue. So what's going on behind that? So it doesn't give us an excuse to, oh, I have no control and I can just go act out. I've learned enough tools. If I chose to go act out now, it was absolutely my choice and my decision. You know, I could have picked up the phone and called Dr. Rob, you know, so, so it, there's a difference. There's a tipping point where, you know, in active addiction, we really are out of our minds, you know, learning to do things differently. Now we, we don't have control and we're never fixed, but we can learn to do life differently. And, and we know that because we, you know, we hear from clients all the time that, you know, it's changed their life. It's recovery's changed our life. So does that makes sense. You know, sense? Tammy, what you brought up for me is the idea of relapse prevention, which is, you know, we, yes, we have people look at the path. I was funny. I was going to mention seeking integrity too, because I think this is a part of their path is when I'm acting out in the world, you know, I just think I want to go sex and I do it. Like it doesn't, you know, oh, this will be fun. That'll be fun. I have an opportunity, whatever it's opportunistic. It's whatever it is. But once you have these tools, you know that you have to call someone, you know, have to reach out to someone, you know, you got to uh, write or do or walk or you know, do anything you can to not do it. Then, then I am responsible. I am accountable to the actions that I don't take. So if I end up going to the massage parlor, but I didn't call my sponsor, I didn't call my therapist, I didn't reach out to my group. I didn't go online to one of our groups and I haven't told anyone, then, then I've screwed myself. And now I'm accountable for the whole thing. So what Tammy means is if you're drinking and you're drinking in the bar every day, you're hanging out in sex clubs all the time, you may not know any other lifestyle. I mean, that'd be all you know, and that's how you live and you just lie and cheat. And But once you have a glimpse of how you've hurt other people and the, the actions you need to take, you're then accountable to those actions. And those actions will keep you sober. It's like I say to the guys in treatment all the time. In fact, right now, because they come to this group and hi guys, see you tomorrow in group or something like that. I thought I'm doing a lecture for you tomorrow, something like that. But anyway, it's like when I have to, I will never, you know, stop wanting to act out. It occurs to me when I'm under stress or um, I'm having a, you know, a, abandonment, someone died or something. It still comes up in my mind, but I know that it's not about sex. I say to myself, wow, that crazy brain of mine. In fact, my sponsor years ago, Tammy used to say, when he wanted to act out, he would say, I'm having a flare up of my mental illness, <laughs> which meant, you know, he recognized that he was in trouble, that it was not because of an opportunity to act out, but that he was scared or vulnerable. He didn't know what he was feeling. I don't always know what I'm feeling, but I know I need to reach out to someone. I know that I don't want to have sex. I think it's an idea in the moment. Why didn't I want to sex this morning? Why didn't I have it? Because this is my way of escaping. And if I just get that every time I'm thinking this way, it means I need to reach out to someone and ask for help. That is the action that will keep me sane. Yeah. It's the data. It's like, oh, I need to, I need to get help and input on this. So, okay. Next question. You have reframed the concept of codependence and introduced protopendence codependence. Isn't it time you introduced a more simple words to explain intimacy disorder as these words seem to be complicated than they are? Uh, I'm not sure. I mean, so codependence has been a word in the language for almost 40 years. I think most people understand what it means have, you know, not, well, I think the concept has become distorted and it's been problematic for lots of people, but I think that p things need names. And when I talk about prodependence, it's a whole way of viewing partners that accepts that they love people who have made mistakes or are broken and they stayed with us because they love us not because there's something wrong with them and codependency said there's something wrong with you for loving this person so to yes they are just concepts and but there are also ways of living and viewing your life and viewing other people if i were a very giving person well sometimes i can be if i but if you i was are. you know constantly volunteering my time and well i do 
But yeah. anyway, if it's a very, very generous person, you know, these days someone might say, even to a fault, they say, well, you're not taking care of yourself. You're taking care of all these people. You must be so codependent. What if I'm just a very giving person who's pro-dependent, who's encouraging a dependency? Who? So I don't know. That's another way of saying it. I'm not sure that people, who, pro-dependence is not about any disorder. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with partners. I'm simply saying that they are pro-positive, their relationships. And when they stand up for them, it's about of love. So I think saying you're pro, positively dependent is probably a good thing. So I wish I had better words for you. Um, I'm not sure how to well, fix well, it. The whole intimacy disorder and, you know, people often assume intimacy is just about sex and i'm going like no ask a sex addict they can have sex and have zero intimacy and dr rob and i've actually talked about this because i think anybody even even an alcoholic has an intimacy disorder because we're you know we, oh, you we are all about escaping and numbing out and everything else so so and not turning to is, people not avoiding right. people Right. So that's really what it is. But we have people, you know, a, a porn addict, you know, a, a serial cheater, all of those. I kind of, when people call me, I say, you know, it's kind of a catch all for all of the people that, you know, don't identify necessarily as sex addicts, but, you know, have mm. issues with relationships and things like that. So. Well, also, to be honest, the term sex addict is not particularly appealing to a lot of people as, you know, but if you say, wow, you have an intimacy disorder, which is true, it's a lot more palatable, a lot easier for people to swallow than saying, you know, you have a sex addiction. And so it is an opening and a doorway into helping people look at themselves without shame. Yeah. But nobody that I recall calls and says, I have an intimacy disorder and I think I need treatment. No. They've got consequences with, you know, in our case, sexual acting out, you know, sometimes combined with or porn. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, or sometimes combined with chemical addiction, but yeah. Anyway. Okay. Enough said, let's go on to the next question. Um, Dr. Rob, is being sexually abused as an adult common for love addicts? I've been looking into the polyvagal system and the freeze response to abuse. Um, sexually abused as an adult. So that's an interesting question because um, I'm not exactly sure. So let me give you some thoughts about this. I don't know if this is helpful. To me, mental health in part is the balance between our emotions and our intellect. So when I go on a date, I might, oh, they're so nice and they're so wonderful and they're so sweet and look in their eyes and this is great, that's emotional. But healthy people also have an intellectual ability to say, but they're using heroin and they're still married and I probably should go on another date. The problem is being a love addict, whatever you want, it's an intimacy disorder, right? I am completely in my emotions when I'm dating. And so I'm not thinking clearly, I'm so caught up in the maybe and if, and we used to say uh, on a way of like, I would throw Christmas lights over people and they were just sparkling and, but I didn't really see who they were. And so I would move forward on my emotions without really having this intellectual ability to say, wait a minute, this person may not be safe. This may not be a good idea. And so I think people who are love addicts, if you say, want to say it that way, miss what healthier people see we miss, and sexual abuse is a big part of it, which is I've been abused and I've been abused. I probably didn't see it coming and maybe I don't see this coming. So it's really a, a question of awareness. And the, what I always say to the women I work with is don't go on a date without calling someone. Don't go on a date and you know, dates are when you're back out in the world. Dates are, you know, two people coming together in a brightly lit coffee shop to chat for a while and separate. No candles, no moonlight, no wine. And the second date might be going for a walk. And I don't think we should have sex for a while. And it's not because I'm your grandmother. It's because in our world, we need to go slow so that our intellect can catch up with our emotions and we can more clearly see who the person is. And this is why you have to reach out because when I'm dating someone and I'm in that love addiction place, I just think everything is about them and wonderful. And all I see is moonbeams and starlight. And it's when I run it by my recovering friends that they say, well, wait a minute, you said you wanted someone who was this or that, and this person is that or this. So I use other people's intellect to guide me toward what healthy relationships are and not rather than depending on myself, because I know I've made mistakes in this area and I don't need to prove anything. I can get others to support me in dating. So that might be helpful, might not. Any thoughts, Tony? I do, because it's a is being sexually abused as an adult. And I, I, I would just want to... Mm -hmm encourage you if this is currently happening you know please please you know i i don't know what it would take for you to be safe but you know i, I don't think anybody should be sexually abused physically abused verbally abused so so you know if you can do something to find safety you know i would encourage that and then you know there's a lot of people 
who have processed through abuse trauma, you know, doing trauma work. And there are a lot of really good therapists that can help support working through that aspect as well. So there and is if you help. call or write, if you Tammy, mm -hmm. T-A-M-I at seekingintegrity.com. The reason I tell you that is Tammy and I have been in this field a long time and we don't just refer to people, we refer to people that we know are good. And in the trauma arena, it's such a sensitive, vulnerable. In fact, I had a client recently say to me, Tammy, that they were told they had an intimacy problem. And what the therapist said to do was stare them in the eye to see when they felt uncomfortable. And I'm thought, oh my God, this person has no idea what they're doing. So uh, it's addiction therapists and trauma therapists really are experts. And it's hard to find us because in a sea of therapists who say they do everything and they know everything, um, it's best to rely on advice. And so we're glad they give that to you or you know wherever you feel people can support you in it. But these are tough areas. These are specialty areas. This isn't like going to the therapist and saying, well, my mom died or I got depressed or I don't know what to do about a job or my daughter. This is about very, very deep and, and uh, early damage that requires a lot of help. Okay, next question. My husband denied he was an addict when I first found out about a supposed one night stand. Now he says he's an addict. What's the difference between an addict and someone who just cheats repeatedly? Well, um, I think people who cheat repeatedly are immature. I think people who cheat on a regular basis don't really understand what their relationship means, how important it is that they need to protect it. And so they sort of go out in the world and it's like, when I'm out in the world, well, I think of it like this. It's like the kid who's told not to go to the cookie jar because his mom said no cookies and he goes and sneaks the cookies. And then she, you know, we do what we want to do and we don't really consider um, how it's going to affect people or any of that. So cheaters tend to be immature. We have this idea uh, in therapy called keeping someone in mind. So Tammy's in mind. Whenever I make something going on in business, whatever it is, I think, oh, I better call Tammy to check it out because we work closely together in different states, by the way, in case anybody thinks. <laughs> um, but I, I have Tammy in mind. I think I'm not going to make this decision without running it by her or questioning. That to me is, is mature way of thinking about it. So in a relationship, if I am making decisions on my own and not reaching out for help, and then I am very likely to make mistakes over and over again because I'm immature. Someone who cheats repeatedly has usually had consequences and they disregard them. Um, they are doing it. Uh, that's not all they're doing. They're probably looking at porn. They're probably doing other stuff. They don't seem to care how it affects you. I mean, you know, if I was cheating and I didn't have these issues and you found out, I think I would be, it would be very hard for me to see your face, you know, having cheat on you and hurt you. But as a sex addict, what I'm going to do is deny, 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 push you away, try to blame you so that I can keep doing what I'm doing. And um, by the way, one more thing, sex addiction is a repetitive pattern that often starts in late adolescence or, you know, certainly by your early twenties. So if someone has not had a history of cheating relationships, they don't have a history you know, that it probably is more uh, a single or double episode rather than um, something that's a lifelong problem. By the way, though, you won't know until you hear the truth and you won't get the truth out of somebody who's cheating. So it's a challenge. You have to protect yourself regardless. And I mean, in every way I have, we have guys who are going out during COVID and hitting on doing whatever and then coming home. I have many women I work with who have HPV because, which causes women cervical cancer because the guy was asymptomatic. It didn't occur to him there's anything wrong with him. So if you have someone who's cheating, at least protect your health. There's nothing more uh, uh, eye-awakening for a husband when you say, I want you to wear a condom if you're going to have sex with me. That's a pretty eye-awakening moment for us. Um, and of course, we don't want to do it. So things like that, protect yourself. Go get tested. Your husband or spouse says, why are you getting STD test? Well, look what you did. Why would I trust? You know, take care of yourself rather than focusing on what this person is doing, because this person is likely to hurt you and not even think twice about it. Next question. In your opinion, what's the difference between sobriety and recovery? Well, this one's on you, Tammy. Start. Yeah, yeah, I was going to say, can I answer this? Yes. Okay. So I, I hear all the time, oh, I just had discovery last week and my husband's in recovery. And I'm like, no, he's not. If he stopped the mm -hmm. behavior, I call that abstinence. It's like just stopping the behavior is like, like an al alcoholic stopping drinking. I stopped the drinking. Great. That's abstinence. 
there's no recovery yet because we're clueless. So then I talk about sobriety and that's a path. And that's like the people that are starting to engage in the 12 steps. They're starting to do things. They're still making a lot of, you know, like not great choices because they don't know better yet. Recovery is a completely different way of living. To me, recovery is I've worked the 12 steps. I'm on a different path. I'm showing up and telling, you know, Dr. Rob, you know, when I told you, you know, whatever, you know, I didn't do whatever, whatever. I'm being accountable for what I'm saying. I'm being accountable for what I'm doing. You know, people can tr- count on me. If I don't do something, I'm going to tell you why I didn't get it done. You know, I, I don't lie. I don't lie to myself. I don't lie to others. So that's recovery and that's a journey. And you don't get that. I mean, that honestly, that takes really a couple of years to, to really start feeling like you've made, you know, some strides in that. And, but, but you should see, you know, abstinence stopping the behavior, sobriety. Okay. I'm starting to see, you know, there's a few changes, but recovery is like, you know, they're mostly trustworthy. You you know, you don't constantly worry is the other shoe going to drop. So that's my take on it. What are your thoughts? I think recovery is a lifelong journey that I understand is not just about my acting out. It's about the way I treat people and the way I look at life and the way I think about my needs versus other needs. I think recovery is a long-term journey that I know I will never be done with till the day I die because I can always grow and I can always be a better person and recovery offers uh, a lifestyle and a support. Um, another way of thinking about it is, and the, and the men that I, we work with at Seeking Integrity really don't like this. Um, they have to find a way to do it for themselves. I don't recover. I might get sober because you got angry at me and you found out. And I might go to treatment because I don't, as all of the people we work with, because I got in trouble. You know, I don't want this person to leave me or I don't want to lose this job or I'm afraid I'll get arrested. You know, that's why people come to treatment and they can get sober. But what we're trying to preach is a lifestyle change. And, you know, again, the guys that I work with, uh, I just tell them, like, you're not going to work more than 45 hours a week. You're going to work 45 hours a week. Those of you who work 60 hours a week, that has to change because you have to dedicate your life to self-care and being reflective and slowing down. Um, We think we can take it all on. I thought I was a superhero. I could do my sexual acting out. I could do my job. I could do my relationship. And we all think we have it so together. But once it all falls apart, I think part of the responsibility of the addict, we need to understand how vulnerable we are that I'm not so strong, I'm not so powerful, and I am very, I'm actually more vulnerable than most people, and I need to pay more attention to how I live my life, and live my life life differently for me. Many people say, I want my, this person to forgive me, I want this to work out, that's great, but we have this phrase, and it seems so silly, but it is so essential, which is, whatever I put in front of my recovery, I will lose, and so someone decides, well, I'm going to some meetings, but I'm going to keep work as my priority, or um, or, you know, I'm going to keep make my spouse happy and we're going to love each other again. And that you're going to lose that spouse because if you don't learn how to live differently, you're going to end up back where you were. And recovery is about learning to live differently, not just about a behavior. So, yeah, I think between the two of us, we nailed it. Don't you, Tammy? Yeah. And I, I want to take on to what you just said, because I often hear from the addicts, you know, including on webinars where they're like, how do I help my partner? And they've completely shifted the focus from how do I work on right. me so that I can be different so that my partner will see that it's like, I'm going to take the focus and I'm going to focus on them. And I need, I need to fix them. I need to help them heal. I'm like, no, you doing what you need to do for you, like for ourselves so that we can be in a different place is how they start seeing that we're different. So, well, okay. I don't want to add to that. I, we get a lot mm-hmm. of, when is my spouse not going to be so angry at me? When are they going to calm down when and I think well why don't you just let them be angry I mean that's not the focus is to get them less angry or to get them to love you the focus is on you and as Tammy said if I start living my life in recovery my partner will notice and they will show up not because I'm saying I'm sorry and please forgive me and you know but because they see that life change and it gives them hope so if you're with someone who's sober you're not going to have that hope if you see them changing their lives you're going to have that hope yeah so um, how does a couple rebuild this kind of tags on? How does a couple rebuild trust when the addict was in recovery for 18 months yet still lying? This goes back to this is one of the people that go, no, he's not in recovery. If he's still lying to you and gaslighting the entire time, he may not be acting out. Doesn't sound like he even stopped that, but you know, that, that to well, me is question, like, nope, it's not recovery. So that and you question, can't build trust with somebody we, that's lying. Right. You cannot rebuild for trust if you. Look, what is trust? It's a belief that when this person is with me or when they're away from me, I can, they will respect and honor their word and their commitments. 
So what happens in our relationships is I suddenly realize that you don't have my back. You're not going out in the world and making sure that I don't get hurt. You're actually doing things that leave me getting hurt. And so I can never trust someone who I know is continuing to go out in the world or in front of their computer and hurt me and let me down. Trust is only built by, and I think I have a, an equation for this, um, honest and reliable actions over time. I have to act in a reliable and honest, integrous fashion, and I have to do that over time. So there is no recovery unless you've got a lot of time. And this is why I wrote Out of the Doghouse, which is a great book for men to read. Well, it's a book for any man who's hurt a woman's, broken a woman's heart. But really, I think that we often think, well, it's, they know, and it's been out for a while, and I've been working on it. Why haven't they forgiven me? And we don't understand that it takes a very long time, not just of stopping the behavior, but of you feeling safe with us and, and that we're being honest. So trust, no, you're not going to restore trust. If this just happened that you found out the lying was going on after 18 months of being in recovery, it's going to be a year or more before you can rebuild trust. In fact, right now, this is not the right question. Oh. I say to every single partner in every single partners groups, and I'll say it here, you have three jobs, you spouses, during the first year of our recovery. Number one, to get angry at us and be as angry as you need to be. You don't get to hit us or tell us our lives are not worth living, but you can be angry. Number two, you need to decide whether you want to be with us or not. Is this the right relationship as you work through your anger and your fear by observing us and seeing what we're doing and figuring it out? And the third thing is to take care of yourself. You know, you can't love us into recovery. You have to love yourselves and we have to love ourselves into recovery. Remember that two people who have been in this situation, I can't turn to my spouse. Look, you're my best friend. You're my spouse. I've been, you know, I want to turn to you with every problem, but I'm the one who hurt you. And so I can't, you know, you ask about this question, what is recovery? It's turning to the people who are not angry at me, who are not hurt, who are objective. And it's the same for the spouses. You can't turn to us and confide in us or get our support because you don't trust us. And so this is why as much as you guys don't want to, and it's foreign to you, you have to turn outside your relationship to support it others therapists, support groups, because your partner can't be the supportive person anymore. You don't trust them. So, and I don't know if this is a male addict, female partner. I don't know, but there are re resources for both male and female partners on sex and relationship healing.com. There are dropping groups. I'm glad they're you're free. Here. They're, free. they're free. We do. But I free. also, if this is a male, this is the kind of client that we work with at Seeking Integrity Treatment Program. This is what we help with. So, so feel free to reach out to me, Tammy, T-A-M-I at SeekingIntegrity.com. I'm happy to give you information. At the very least, we have a work group starting for sex and porn addiction 101. Uh, starts April 7th. It's a six-week course, 90 minutes, and there's a there's some foundation pieces, some education, and that has been a good a good dipping your toe in. But yeah, you, know, you you cannot build trust in a relationship by yourself. And I, I just really and by the way, that course, that series that we do online is based on sex addiction 101 and the workbook that goes with it. So we take them through like six or eight exercises and you know over the course of month and a half and then if they want to go on they can do more you know whatever that is i do want to say to all of you by the way, we do advertise our product we say i talk about books tammy talks about and i'm not just talking about all the free stuff i think 80 percent of what we do is free but if we get a few people who go to our treatment center that pays for the 80 percent of everything else to is free that everything else we do that's free so i'm not shy at all about First of all, I think the work is amazing and whatever level you get it on, whether you're going to free podcasts or free groups, you decide to enter things that we charge you for, just know that um, our focus is on helping as many people as we can at every level we can. And I know for a fact that most of you, well, many of you can't afford therapy. Many of you will never make a treatment center, but if we can help, you know, for free online, I mean, that's a gift that, that we can give you. Um, the podcast sex, love, and addiction has over 800, well, was it 700, almost 700,000 700, downloads? Uh -huh. You looked at the numbers today. I so did. people are going there and they're using that podcast, which is free to learn and guide themselves. And so we give a lot of things away for free. And so if you hear us say, you know, think about this course, because I'm a little self-conscious about it. I want you to understand that we're not just on here to sell our wares, but it is important to us because that is how we get to do all this free stuff so i'm making excuses but for it's us, not Tammy, just but... a, uh, yeah and i'm gonna i'm gonna stop you because like You're these right. are resources it's not like this isn't selling wares this is giving you valuable resources where are you the work group 350 dollars for six 90 minute sessions where are you going to get that with people that will guide you through the sex addiction 101 workbook 
you know, I don't know anywhere else. So, so it's the kind of um, resources that are really meaningful. I had a therapist that reached out that shared about a client that the only thing he was doing was going through the level one and, le and then level two work groups. And she said, I can see a difference. He had by that point strung 60 days together, which he was unable to do prior to that time, you know, even working with the, and this is a good therapist, you know, so, so it does, it matters. And for, I'm sorry, but I, I spent way more than that kind of money on my acting out. I have to believe that I could scrape together $350 for something that would help me change. So, well, actually, I want to go back to and say that I should not be uh, in any way uncomfortable about selling things because what we're selling, I don't think there's a better treatment. I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years. I've opened multiple treatment centers. There are, is no better work that I know of going on with this. And so when we're selling, and certainly not at the prices we charge. So I think if I'm promoting things, it's because I don't want you to go to that crappy therapist. I don't want you to go to that lousy treatment center because we know there's lots and they'll charge you a fortune um, and they'll be very nice to you, but they may not get it and we get it. And so I feel, actually, I feel good about it, but we need to go back you, to our volunteer should. work. Here. Yes, so, yeah, you should, because I mean, I hear all the time of people that went to other treatment centers and it didn't work well, out we and they them. went yeah so yeah we, yeah, we do get them hopefully if they still have time and money so okay all right next question additional disclosure 13 months after disclosure i assume that was a formal disclosure three four additional things disclosed two were expected related to past sexual experience with men two were related to violence against women one girl met at a party and threatened jumped out of moving car thereafter picked up a prostitute and threatened her if she did not give oral she did he dropped her off no pay same night then two days later, he said he, he has one more. There was an innocent girl taken by the arm back of the store, threatened to take her pants off, told her to give him oral or he would kill her. She did. He left. This was 35 years ago before we met within a year. I am in shock and find myself hypersexual and lost. What is what to do? Well, hypersexual means having a lot of sex. And I have a feeling you don't mean hypersexual. I have a feeling you mean hyposexual, meaning you don't want everything to do with sex. I mean, I don't know what that means, but... Um, so there are so many, I'm not sure what is the question? Like is, what is the question in here exactly? Tammy? What to I do? I want to answer the, the, Yeah, the question is what to I'd do. I'd send this man to treatment. I mean, honest yeah. to God, I mean, well, I mean, obviously there's offending behavior from the past and uh, that doesn't mean the person is, you know, 35 years ago might mean they were 19, they were flushed with testosterone, they did some really stupid things or stupid things. But this is, some of this is kind of violent. And Very so, violent. and you don't just become, that doesn't just go away. We become more mellow with time and our behaviors change. But, um, you know, I have to, I've had to say to a couple of clients in treatment, oh, so you raped someone. Or maybe you entered your spouse while they were sleeping. You raped someone. And it's not a pleasant thing when the guys I talk to have to realize that they raped something. It doesn't mean that they are serial sex offenders. It does mean that maybe they were a sex addict and they were drinking and they, you know, whatever it is. But um, I, I just think there's, I don't know, Tammy, there's so much here. And the other piece is how could you, how could anyone not disclose this on an initial disclosure? How is it possible? Because she said additional, or he said additional disclosure, which means this came out later. And I'm a little worried about the person who hides or doesn't tell you that that they've you know, been sexually violent with people or sexually abusive to people. Forget that he had another affair or she saw another part. I mean, this is stuff that I can't imagine doing a disclosure and not talking about. So uh, honestly, I still would not trust this person, no offense. Um, I think that this is someone who should be in treatment or at least in meetings four days a week. And you know, this person needs a very structured way of working with a lot of support. And my guess is that if they were able to not tell you about this in the beginning, then they're able to push it out of their minds too, and minimize what it meant um, if they can not tell you. So if this is second disclosure and you're hearing stuff like this, I think it's very concerning is what I, I would say. I don't know what Tammy's thoughts are. Well, and and there's a tag on in the chat to us. and But part of it is if your way of coping is with sex, then of course you're going to hmm. be wanting to go to your numbing out uh, so, so that, that makes sense, but yeah, th this person needs, needs more help. So, but I'm glad you're here. Um, make oh. sure you're on the alumni group tomorrow. Okay. So someone, I do want to, so this is actually someone who went through treatment. They're saying, and they have a question about, I wanted to go back to it because they, Oh, I just uh, put it in said, the answer. Check it out. No, no. I'm looking what they chatted. Uh, they said, 
I do find myself wanting sex just back from two weeks of treatment. Well, duh. <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry, you're human. And the way we connect as sex addicts and feel comforted and like we're not going to abandon and like we can tolerate the difficulties of recovery is by having sex. I mean, that is our go-to thing. So of course you want to have sex. And even if it's just your partner, uh, I can't tell you how many partners I work, run, work with who say, I felt like he or she wasn't even present when we were having sex with each other. Um, we do it, discourage sex for a short period of time when people get home. Uh, they don't really think about it. They're kind of like, oh, well, they're my spouse, so I can have sex with them. And we actually want them to take 30 days out, whatever is most useful for that person. Because I know as an active sex addict, I didn't even know who I was if I wasn't flirting or racing somewhere to find someone, or who are we and what is our life about uh, if we're not doing that? So uh, I would absolutely put a boundary around this. And I would talk to my spouse about this. I thought it was a spouse. It's interesting because spouses often want to have more sex with us once they find out, not all of you, but there is sort of a sometimes, okay, now I know everything. Now I know what's going on. Now I know who this person is. Now they finally opened up to me. I think it's both. I think, I think it's this, and, and we, uh, we need to keep moving on. I think it's both. I think the disclosure happened to this person and he, he's just back from treatment. So it's, I suspect that both of them have some, some issues. So, but I hope well, you are working with a, your, a qualified therapist, you know, as part of your aftercare, I hope you're working with a qualified therapist too. By the way, the way, I'm sorry, Tammy. One of the reasons I acted out was I wanted to make sure I never got abandoned. There was always somebody there. And so on some level, I think, you know, uh, when we come home to our spouses, we use sex as reassurance. You know, sex is a symbol of something for us. It's not the thing. So if I came back from treatment, I wanted to have sex with my partner every day, I would think, wow, I wonder what's going on with that. I wonder what the motive is underneath here. I'm afraid they're going to go away. For spouses, it's often like, well, I'm afraid he or she is going to do all this stuff. So I'm going to have a lot of sex with them and then they won't want to do it anymore. And that, that isn't really the way out. Okay, next question. I would like to know how to manage treatment therapy recovery when my spouse does not believe in sex love addiction as an addiction. We are three plus years after D-Day. I have been in therapy since. Not all good therapists, my acting out was, has ceased from D-Day. That's great. I have slipped and masturbated, looked at porn a handful of times over the last three years, oh. but had zero desire to revert back to online cheating, seeking in person cheating, et cetera. My biggest problem is dealing with the emotional trauma and issues, which is blocking my communication with my spouse. I am a gay man uh, in a relationship with a trans man. Well, there's a lot there. Um, I do want to say, just to say it, that I, I mean, I have written 10 books, which is so crazy. Talk about addictions. But I wrote a book called Cruise Control, Understanding Gay Men and Sex Addiction. And I think when you live in a culture that is so surrounded, that is very different than heterosexual culture, that you need to really take a look at what is problematic about my behavior versus what is typical in this community. Um, so uh, I think the question is how, when my spouse doesn't believe it. And uh, so what I hear in that question is, if they only believed it, then what? You know, then they would be what? More forgiving, kinder, it doesn't matter whether they believe it or not. What matters is you take care of yourself. You do all the things you need to. You know, if I had, I don't know, is another way of saying it. Um, if I had an alcohol problem, my partner said, well, I don't think you drink that much. It's not really a big deal for me. But I knew it was destroying my life. Um, you know, I would make a commitment to change regardless of what my spouse had to say. In fact, I might think, well, my spouse doesn't fully understand. I've had many spouses say, I don't fully get it. It isn't a problem. Um, or, you know, whatever it is, and it's because they don't fully understand the depth of the problem or the reality of how compulsive it is, and it'll come back and all of that stuff. So, um, yeah, that's a bunch of stuff. Pammy? Yeah, I, you know, no, I, I'm just, but I hear you going, how do I manage my treatment therapy recovery with your, um, with your sponsor, with your recovery community, you do what you need to do you know, and I think it's fair to just say, I really need to do this for me before my recovery. And, you know, I, I, I will include you in wherever you want to be included, like on webinars, or, but all, but otherwise I have to do this for me. Just like Dr. Rob was talking about earlier, whatever I put in front of my recovery, I'm going to lose. So, so um, keeping recovery at the forefront is really beneficial. But I really think having worked with so many people, the essence of this question is, um, if my spouse just understood this, then we'd have a different relationship or then we'd be treating me differently or, 
you know what? Your relationship is what it, what, what it is. And if you're cleaning your crap up and you're working on yourself and what difference does that make whether your spouse believes in it, doesn't believe in it, it doesn't matter. You are living on a road of recovery. And I have to say, you know, there is a point and I say this to spouses um, and I'll say it to you spouses, if we're really doing our work and working really hard and you can see it and you see us changing and you see and clear that we're not acting out. And, you know, some of us are very dedicated. I, I know I was for sure. Um, at a certain point, your, your anger becomes counterproductive. You know, as I said, your job is to be angry at us for a year. Absolutely. But at a certain point, if we're really working very hard and you continue to be so angry, you know, it's been a year, whatever, we start to question. It's like, well, I'm doing what I need to be doing and I'm the best person I can be and I'm not acting out. And am I ever going to get any reward from this relationship? I know that was a year ago and I know I hurt you, but look at all I'm, you know, it's not like you have to reward me for what I'm doing, but at a certain point, um, there has to be a beginning of a shift where partners aren't constantly doubting everything we do and questioning everything we do, um, even though they feel that that's necessary for their safety. And, you know, you guys get a year longer if we don't do our thing, but at a certain point, you have to understand that you're pushing us away more than you're inviting us in. And what I hear is, well, if I tell my partner all about it, they won't be as angry because they'll understand it's an addiction and not, I'm not a bad person, but I have an addiction. It doesn't matter. Uh, what matters is you focus on yourself. Um, and they may never okay. believe it. Yeah. Next question. Hi, Dr. Rob. How would a sex addict work with religious shame and guilt from childhood upbringing and move forward into healthy sexuality? This happens so often. Well, it is absolutely true factually that we see more people in with all addictions, but especially sexual and intimacy disorders when they grow up in very, very conservative backgrounds. And that has nothing to do with the religion. It could be Christian, could be Muslim, could be Jewish. They're all, all different sects and re religions have very, some very, very rigid. And some of those more conservative environments will tell you that sex is bad. And you'll hear sex is bad, masturbation is bad, you know, all, and, and sex becomes something that's shameful and to be feared. And part of the problem is when you get that at such an early age, it resonates for the rest of your life. And it's interesting to me that you asked this question because when we treat drug addicts, most of the drug who have sex problems, almost all of them have been through a treatment center for drugs and alcohol. They've already been there. They've tried it out, but no one talked about because they don't know how, or they're not thinking about, about their sexual fears, their sexual shame there. And so they go out in the world and try to be sober on drugs or try to be al alcohol or gambling. But the root thing, which is they hate themselves for their sexuality or parts of it drives them back to the, um, to the alcohol and drugs. So how do you work with this? You talk about all of it. You write down all of it. You find there are therapists who deal with religious abuse. And I think that, you know, that's something that's useful looking for. You can just Google it and you'll find some crazy people and some good people. But to me, this is no different than any kind of trauma. It takes dedicated work in reducing my own shame in life to understand that what happened to me left me with these problems, but I'm not a bad person. Um, living, not living in shame, but living in transition into self-love um, you can't fix what happened, but you can readdress how you look at it now and how you look at your life. And that's therapy and 12, again, 12 step and a lot of support. Yeah. Yeah. The messages of like this, you know, this is shameful can be replaced with, you know, this is, this is for me. But you'll always sexuality. feel a little dirty. Yeah. You'll, I mean, I'm you'll sure. always, yeah. but that's yeah. something to work, to talk to. Oh yeah. I feel this way, but I've learned differently. And, and then mm -hmm. you move on. Mm -hmm. When it comes to an addict disclosing a slip to their partner, what are the steps the partner can take to process? I find myself torn between wanting my partner to be completely honest about his slips and wanting to keep myself from being constantly hurt. Well, you should not be constantly hurt. I know that. I heard that too. You know, I was like, constantly. That is like a number lot. one. I'm sorry. Well, number one is what is a slip? And a slip is what I would not tell my partner. And sorry, partners. Um, if I had a sponsor and I was working my 12 step program and I had a therapist and I drove through the wrong part of town or I got really, I was flirting with someone at work, nothing happened, but, or whatever it was, I would not tell my spouse. I don't think it's my spouse's job to hear every time I have a sexual attraction, every time I do something that probably isn't perfect. But when I slip, I need to tell them because that is the bottom line. They are trusting me to let them know if there's, you know, they're not going to find out a year later that I was went back to seeing sex workers, they're going to know. And what the spouse said, I think is extremely important because all over time, many of you will say, if they do this again, I'm going to leave them. 
You know, if they see the sex worker, they, and trust me, we're going to struggle with this. We may do it again, but what really matters is that we tell you, because I've seen every partner look up and say on some level, wow, I hate them. And this is not going to be a good night or a good week. But I love the fact that they told me because of the first time I can make decisions about my life and about what's going on with us based on truth and fact. So yes, I think that if someone is having slips, they shouldn't be so frequent that they're causing you constant hurt if they're slipping. And I mean, slipping, going into the depths of that behavior, they need a lot more help than they're getting and they need to take it more seriously. But if what you describe as a slip or whatever it is they're saying to you is, oh, I, I, you know, I talked to Susie online for a few minutes and I felt attracted to her or you know, I got a letter from my ex and I started reading it and fantasized and then I threw it away. You know, that's not something we necessarily have to tell you. And I know spouses want to know every single thing, but here's something I want to tell you, all of your spouses with the greatest love and respect that I have. It, it is part of your belief that if I ask this question or learn the answer to that question, that I'm going to feel better or things are going to get better. And the reality is it's not going to get better and nothing we tell you is going to make you feel better because this is a horrible situation. And one more thing, I think that spouses, one of the misunderstandings I think addicts have is we think, oh, they, they're asking these questions. They're going through my phone bill. They're doing all this stuff because they want to figure out if they should leave me or not. And they're looking to find that thing that's going to tell them they have to leave. And I don't think that's true at all. I think spouses are looking for reasons to not leave. They're looking to hopefully not find anything to know about, to realize, they wanna realize this is what happened. I can deal with this and I don't wanna find out anything more so I can deal with this. Um, but when you leave your par partner constantly doubting, nothing's gonna go forward. And yes, you have to be completely honest with your spouse, but if you're slipping that often, what your spouse needs to say is, I want you to go to a treatment center or I'm locking the door, or it's great that you're being honest, but it's not okay to be honest, honest, honest and keep slipping. Like that's not the goal is to be honest. The goal is to stop the behavior and the honesty comes with it. I know Tammy, is there anything else about that? No, but it ties into the next question with the looking for safety. I'm learning that I may have fallen into, this is what I'm learning. And let me tell you what you can read and learn. He feels micromanaged and now is telling me he needs space. Is that normal? I agreed to give him distance. I'm gonna leave this one to you to start, Tammy. Well, it, to me, it, 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 I was talking to somebody not too long ago and they were talking about, you know, check-ins. And I was like, if he's checking in with you and sharing things rather than you having to ask questions and, and everything right. else, that's a, that's a very different thing. It's like reporting the slips. If the addict is coming forward and, and sharing, that's a very different space than, you know, than the partner having to demand the information all the time. So to me, this is like, yes, you've learned, you get support, having him have um, sharing what he's learning and doing you know, that may, yes. Uh, having the addict share what is going on could provide you with safety. And I think having that conversation of, you know, I understand you need some distance. Here's what will help me feel safe is if you're you know, you initiate the conversation. You tell me a little bit more. I'd like to know, you know, so it kind of shifts the responsibility for that. And you may not feel as parental about, you know, here, read this book, do this, whatever. Um, it may, that may help. That was my thought. I'm glad this person's asking this question. I really like that because the emphasis could be, I keep throwing books at my partner and they won't read them. So I like that this per partner is questioning, you know, is this the right way to do it? Is this, you know, am I driving this person away? And, and I, I, you know, we say in the 12-step programs that it's a lot about attraction rather than promotion. And so I think that if you're reading a book that you think is useful, especially one of mine, because they're so useful, <laughs> just kidding. Um, if you're reading a book around this issue, you know, you might say to your partner, oh, I'm reading this book. And if you're interested, let me know. That's invitational. Maybe they've read the book. Maybe they know everything in the book. Maybe they don't need to read that book. You know, it'll make you feel better, but won't make them feel better. So I think being invitational is always helpful. I, I, there's a book on the books, but not here. You read this because I also would feel like, oh, this is mom and I've been a bad kid and now I have to study my homework, you know, and I don't think you want to be that in that role of mom or parole officer with your partner. Um, what else do I want to say about this? Um, oh, the other thing is what Tammy was talking about is when we work with our clients uh, in treatment, when they leave, 
they're going to have a sheet of paper that says, this is what I do on Monday, this is what I do on Tuesday, this is what I do on Wednesday, or certainly it's going to be in narrative form. And I tell all of the addicts who are in a relationship with a partner, I want you to go to the refrigerator and put up your schedule for recovery so your partner can see, oh, on Monday, you're going to this group, and at two o'clock on Thursday, you're doing therapy, and that is your reassurance. You may, you shouldn't have to ask us what we're doing or how we're doing or what we're doing. We should be saying and showing you what we've done. And you should be able to see that without question. We have time for, hey, Tammy, we did 15. We got nine left. That's not bad. Well, it's a lot. So what are your thoughts about when, what to, um, what are your thoughts about to what extent does the betrayed partner need to be involved with the sex addict recovery process, such as being mm-hmm. informed of which, when essay online meetings he or she is doing, booked CSAT sessions, blogs, webinars, you know, seeing and reading a, well, a week? I think we just answered that question, which is I think it's up to the addict to, you should never have to say, did you go to a meeting this week or are you going to your therapy? We are here to reassure you. If you were having to pull out of us what's going on, then I would have doubt if I were, why are you even having to ask me? Because you're asking me because you have doubt and I shouldn't leave you having doubt. You know, you should see me on the phone talking to someone at that meeting, going out to whatever it is. And if you don't see that, what I would say is I'm having trouble trusting you because I don't see you doing a lot of work here. Um, and I'm going to stay in that non-trusting place and still I, but I wouldn't say where'd you go and what you do. Yeah, that's not helpful. And I have shared this before too, but if the addict is pursuing their their sobriety and recovery with the same energy that they pursued their addiction, they're going to do very well and you're going to see it. So, okay, next question. My partner had massive amounts of trauma in addition to betrayal trauma from my porn addiction. And mm-hmm. she says she wants to support me in recovery, but she also pushes back against therapy, refusing to try and incorporate suggestions from couples therapists where she has to put in a bit of work and responds with, why do I have to do that? Why can't he just be better? And she talks about how my trauma has stunted me and stagnated me and acknowledges that she is stagnated, but acts like it does not affect our relationship. How would you recommend I try and address something like this with her so she does not shut down when I bring it up? That's a great question. Well, that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I want to read it again myself because I want to answer this really well. So first of all, I think that in the early stages of our work, it even in all, it's never my job to tell my partner to go to therapy. It's not my job. I can say, I think we would be doing better if we were both working on this process, but you need to be in therapy is a bad idea. And one of the most important things about our work, at least the way I do it, is I don't think couples should be in therapy at the beginning. Because in the first six months, really, what is the therapy? It's me saying, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I ruined your life. And the other person saying, screw you, screw you, you ruined my life. So in the beginning, therapy is really just about boundaries. Your spouse has no, you cannot judge whether your spouse needs to go to therapy. It is not your job to focus on what they need. And if you feel that the the revived that their therapy being revived and harming them is related to what they're going through now, then they will find a way to deal with it. But I think every time you say to a partner, oh, you need to do this, there, how do I say this? I'll tell you what spouses need. Addicts need direction, challenges, support, uh, contracts, agreements, and a lot of heavy duty therapy. Partners need to deal with the, with the partners need support. You've been violated, you've been victimized, you've been harmed by, by, the tru- by everything that's happened. And so it may well be that, you're, that the partner thinks, oh, I gotta get in there and do a lot of work or the relationship isn't gonna work, or I gotta do a lot of work, but he's the one who, or she's the one who did this to me and now I'm supposed to go to therapy. One of the things I think those partners don't understand is I am not interested in partners doing any exploration of themselves or the relationship or any of it because they didn't cause this. It's not their fault. We walk into the relationship with this. So what we've done is we've damaged someone else and we've harmed them and we further harm them by saying, well, we're never going to get along until you go to therapy. Again, that's trying to run someone else's life so I can be happy. I also hear in this, I don't think your focus is on her. What I hear is, how, what can I do to get our relationship to be better? You can't do anything. It's either going to be better or it's not. And who do you want it to be better for? Do you want your spouse? Maybe they need to be miserable and deal with trauma for six months before they're ready to go to therapy. Is your goal in getting into therapy to get your relationship to be better? Because that's not a good goal. You're getting the relationship to be better is working on yourself and being accountable. 
and seeing how much the work is helping you. And I think that people, if they're, if they're open to being guiding themselves into healing will be someone has a lot of trauma, they know what their issues are. Um, you're not helping. Uh, let me give you a good example. I love this example. It's really awful. I mean, I don't think I've ever said this. So back in the day, and I know we just stopped now, um, my, uh, my, my spouse of 20 years was heavy, like quite heavy. Uh, now we're pretty thin, but at the time, you know, like 30, 40 pounds overweight. And I used to say to him, like, why don't you lose some weight? Or why don't you stop eating this? Or, you know, you've gained a lot of weight. Or, and I went to my therapist and she said, you know, that's abusive. I was like, why is that abusive? And she said, don't you think he already feels bad? Don't you think he already feels bad about himself? And there you are saying, you know, well, if you'd only did this or you only did that, you know, I don't think it's helpful for us to go in and remind our partners what's wrong with them. Um, because they already know on some level, like, oh, you have a lot of trauma. This is being re-engaged. I think they know that. And when they're ready for therapy, they will be. And I suggest you get off their back and start focusing on you because that's like more trauma. Um, so leave them alone. Tammy, you just want to get through every single question. And I know we can't, but let me say this. On Friday nights, I am on intherooms.com, which is a free website for people in 12-step recovery. And you can find me every Friday night at six o'clock California time. I do an hour there. Also on sex and relationship healing, as Tammy said, there are all these free groups. There are all sex and relationship healing.com. There are all these free groups. There's all this free support. There's lectures and, you know, and all kinds of stuff. So, you know, go find it out, go seek it out. And, um, and I just want you to have a blessed evening. I will see you in a week. Tammy, I look forward to working with you tomorrow. Maybe we'll see each other yes, a little bit. I, yeah, we will, because you've got the peer support group. So so thank okay. you. I'm so sorry that we didn't get through all the questions, but do, you know, Friday nights with Dr. Rob, all the other webinars and things. And so you can write trade partner other, groups. If you have, yeah. If you have something go specific, ahead. like how do I go to treatment or how do I find a therapist or what book do I read? Write Tammy, TMI at Seeking Integrity. She's always glad to give a referral or help you guys out. I will if do it's a quick best. question that we can answer. Yeah. Yes. Bye, folks. All right. Thanks, everybody. Bye. <laughs> See you later, Tammy.